It remind me again why we haven't done that? Well, we're idiots. Oh, right. Uh, attention all passengers for flight 1370. It looks like the plane is going to be delayed a little bit longer. The airline has lost the pilot's luggage. Isn't it time you got your pilot's license? Call Ocala Aviation today. 352-861-7484. That's 352-861-7484. Hey, you've earned it. Call today. Ocala's Information Station, 1370 WOCA. Ocala! Five minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this beautiful looking Thursday morning. How are you doing anyway? We've got a really great interview we want to talk about. How many years ago, Robin, did we have an interview with Rashida Ali, Muhammad, Ali, Muhammad Ali's daughter, remember? Yes. That's a pretty, yep. pretty lady, remember? Yep, beautiful. Uh, and uh, we were talking to her. And you know, when you have somebody on the on the phone on, or in the studio who has a famous relative or is married to somebody famous, you, it's almost like you, you're tempted, you want to ask about, in her case, we wanted to ask about her dad, and we did a little bit. Yeah. Um, but we were obviously talking about her book. She's an author. Her sister, beautiful also. She was boxing somewhere, I think. She's a, I think she's a female boxer, right? Yes. Uh, but in, anyway, um, the one question I never knew the answer to, and maybe there's a hint of it in our next interview, was why did he change his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali? What mm -hmm. was the story there? You know, what was behind that? Um, we we all know he um, became a Muslim, correct? Yes, he did. Correct. Um, and, and but well, you know, I never knew that he had a friendship um, with Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. Never knew that. And we know why Malcolm X changed his last name to X. We, if, yes. you, if you read that book oh, when, yeah. you, when you were a kid. The autobiography of Malcolm X. Great book. Johnny Smith is on the phone. He is one of the two authors. The other author is Randy Roberts. The two of them have written a book called Blood Brothers. It is a fascinating book. And I'll be honest, I did not finish it. Um, but I have questions, and we're going to ask them right now. Uh, Johnny Smith is an assistant professor of American history at Georgia Tech. He's a researcher, a best-selling author. The book is called Blood Brothers, The Fatal, Fatal Friendship Between Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. Johnny, this is a fascinating topic you've decided to uh, cover. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Thank you. We're, we're really excited about the book, and uh, I appreciate you having me on the show this morning. You know, I just never made the connection before. And is there a reason for that? Was that by design? Did they not want us to know that they were friends? Yes, uh, absolutely. There's a period from the time they met in June of 1962. At that, that moment, Cassius Clay, he's a contender, but he's not really being taken seriously for the heavyweight title yet. So what Clay and Malcolm know, as Cassius is, is going to Nation of Islam meetings, uh, that he has to be careful because Malcolm X is pretty much the most hated black man in America because he is a man who is a minister in the nation of Islam, which most Americans considered a hate cult. He has said derogatory comments about white people being devils. And so Cassius, as much as he's drawn to the nation of Islam and he's going to these meetings, he has to be careful. He has to protect his boxing career. Yeah, but so what, what, why was he going? Because of the friendship? Well, no. Okay, so what happens is this. When Cassius Clay becomes a professional, in late 1960, he goes to Miami. And in Miami, he trains with Angelo Dundee, who's one of the best trainers in boxing history. And when he's in Miami, he meets a member of the Nation of Islam named Sam Saxon. And the Nation of Islam at that time had mosques in every major city, uh, in the Northeast, in Chicago, in Detroit, in Florida, in the South, in Atlanta. And so when Cassius Clay meets Sam Saxon, he invites him to the mosque. And when Sam and, and Cassius start talking, they become friends. And Sam realizes that even when Cassius Clay was a teenager, he had learned about the Nation of Islam. And what was powerful about the Nation of Islam's message at that time was they believed in black pride, black independence, asserting your freedom. But they also believed in separation. They rejected the integrationist ideals of the Main Street Civil Rights Movement. This appealed to Cassius Clay. Cassius Clay's father had told him ever since he was growing up, you know, don't trust the white man. Stay in your neighborhood. Don't go into white stores. Hmm. And so when he hears a similar message inside the mosque in Miami and in Chicago and in Detroit, this resonates with him. He doesn't believe in an integrated society because he's seen what happens when white people and black people get together. 
He believes that the consequences of integration are violent. Seeing black churches bombed in the South, seeing Emmett Till yeah, yeah, win yeah. in Mississippi. And so, you know, this is something that he can identify with. Okay, so so he goes to, was he raised as a Christian, though, or did he have, like, no religion? Yeah. No, his mother was a devout Baptist, and he grew up in the church. But, you know, what we have to remember is that the mainstream civil rights movement was really a Christian movement for much of the 1950s and the 1960s. <clears throat> but, having <clears throat> said that... That's true. But Clay, when, when, when the uh, KKK bombs the Birmingham church is that, you know, the Christian movement is not going to protect these people. And what he hears Malcolm X say is that the white man, white Christians, they don't care about your safety. The government doesn't care about your safety. And so Malcolm and Elijah Muhammad, who is the Supreme Minister in the Nation of Islam, they say, separate from whites. Come into our mosque and hear the truth, as they saw it. Is Malcolm X considerably older than, than Cassius Clay? Yes. You know, um, at this time, Malcolm was in his mid to late 30s when their relationship is developing. Cassius is in his young 20s. So he's like an older brother to him. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen is this. You know, I heard you earlier asking, you know, why does Cassius Clay change his name to Muhammad Ali? Mm -hmm. It's a complicated story. There's a rivalry developing in the nation of Islam right before Cassius Clay fights for the heavyweight title in 1964 against Sonny Liston in Miami. The leader of the Nation of Islam was Elijah Muhammad, and Malcolm X was his spokesman and one of the chief ministers. The problem was this. Malcolm is becoming more famous than Elijah Muhammad. People see Malcolm. He's on television shows, radio shows. There's major magazine features of him. And Elijah begins to think that Malcolm is getting too big, that he wants to essentially take over the Nation of Islam. And so some of, other, of Elijah's other lieutenants, they see Malcolm as a threat. Now, what does this all mean for Cassius Clay? Yeah, yeah. Cassius Clay has become publicly attached to Malcolm by the time of this fight. He wins the heavyweight title, which means now as the heavyweight champion of the world, he is valuable. He's valuable to Elijah Muhammad in the Nation of Islam, and he's valuable to Malcolm X. The problem is, is that Malcolm has essentially been sent out of the Nation of Islam for making cruel comments about President Kennedy's murder. And so Elijah Muhammad is essentially making moves to push Malcolm X out of the Nation of Islam at the very moment Cassius Clay becomes champion. And so Malcolm is in this position thinking, I'm not returning to the Nation of Islam. My time there is over, but I can't lose this relationship with Cassius Clay, the heavyweight champ in the world. And Elijah Muhammad doesn't want to lose him. So Elijah Muhammad renames Cassius Clay Muhammad Ali. Oh, wow. Did this was a political move. The whole idea of it was to convince Cassius Clay that he was special, that he was going to have an important role in the nation of Islam. And what we have to remember about him is that this champion, who was charismatic, people adored him, he wanted to be loved. He wanted to be special. Yeah. He said all the time, I'm the greatest. Yeah. And Elijah Muhammad says, yes, your name Muhammad Ali means worthy of praise. Is that, was that, is that what uh, Ali means, praise? Muhammad Ali, worthy of praise. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. a a okay, so uh, well, we're almost up against the break, but uh, how did you find all this out? I mean, w was this already in books somewhere? Well, I'll try to keep it short. Essentially what we did is, yes, there were other writers who have written about this relationship, but what they, they had mistakenly done is seen the two men as transitory figures, in their, their lives. But what we tried to show is that their lives were intertwined. You see, what's going to happen is when this rivalry between Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X develops, Malcolm is at a, a moment of crisis because not only does he question Elijah Muhammad's political views, but he also questions who Elijah Muhammad is. Elijah Muhammad preached that he was the prophet of Allah, that he was Allah's messenger. Mm -hmm. However, Elijah Muhammad was not the moral authority that he said he was. He was having multiple affairs with his secretaries and impregnated them. And so Malcolm questions everything about Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. And this is a story that intensifies and ultimately leads to members in the Nation of Islam stalking Malcolm X and his ultimate assassination in 1965. 
Well, part of the book in, in, seems to be uh, suggesting that um, the the, uh, the estrangement of of uh, Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X l- contributed to Malcolm X's assassination. So what we say is this: in March of 1964, a few weeks after Cassius Clay has won the heavyweight title, March 6th, Elijah Muhammad renames Cassius Clay Muhammad Ali, and so there's a break here. But Malcolm had attached himself to Clay because he knows while there are members in the Nation of Islam who want to kill him for spreading stories about Elijah's affairs, as long as he stays attached to the hip of Muhammad Ali, he's safe. Because no one in the Nation of Islam is going to harm the heavyweight champ in the world. He is their prized possession. But once that break takes place and Ali has to reject his friendship with Malcolm X, once Muhammad Ali says, I cannot be seen in public with Malcolm X, Malcolm is more vulnerable to assassins in the nation of Islam. Wow. Let's take a little break, and we'll continue this. If you have any questions, you are welcome to call. The number is 622-9622. Johnny Smith is our guest. The book is a fascinating look at the friendship of Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. The book is called Blood Brothers. The subtitle, The Fatal Friendship Between Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. We'll take that little break right now and be right back. Hi, Matt Wilkerson here, your mobile Verizon rep. But not just here, I'll deliver the phone to you in your home. While I'm there, I'll only sell you what you need and I'll personalize it to you. Want to have me get you connected? Then call me at 352-528-0020. I even offer unlimited home phone service for just $20 per month. Just call me, your mobile Verizon rep, at 352-528-0020. Need a mailbox rental but need more information? Remember, Personal Service Center, 789-6683. How does $10 a month sound with just a three-month commitment? Remember, Personal Service Center, 789-6683. Mention WOCA and the setup fee is waived. Personal Service Center will email or text notifications to you when your packages arrive. Even scan mail so you never actually have to pick it up. Now that's service. Personal Service Center, 789-6683. Located on the corner of Northeast 25th Avenue and 24th Street, Ocala. Look for the yellow signs. Hello, gorgeous. Hi, this is Becky at Hello, Gorgeous Salon. Let's get rid of those sun damage ends and faded out color and get into something rich and vibrant. It's time to get that new look started. So call today and set up your appointment at Hello, Gorgeous Salon, 351-5358. Hello, Gorgeous is a certified Brazilian blowout salon. We can tame those locks, leaving your hair healthy and shiny with a Brazilian smoothing treatment. And whether you're going on a job interview or out on a date, your hands do a lot of talking. Manicures are a must. Hello Gorgeous is a full service salon, so let us help you make a great first impression. Call us today to set your appointment at Hello Gorgeous. Our number is 352-351-5358. Again, that's 352-351-5358. Hello Gorgeous is conveniently located in the heart of downtown Ocala, right next to the historic Marion Theater. And don't forget, we also do men and children's cuts too. Hello Gorgeous. Career Source Citrus Levy Marion brings together business and community partners, economic development leaders, and educational providers to connect employers with qualified, skilled talent, and job seekers with employment and career development opportunities. Tune in the first and third Wednesday of each month at 9:30 a.m. to Career Source Citrus Levy Marion and learn how they can help you. Need an auto loan? Let's compare the big banks to Florida Credit Union. They have new car loans. Slow down, so do we. They have refinance options. Pull over, we do too. They say no a lot. Stop right there. We say yes a lot. Yes to convenience, yes to ease, yes to your personal situation. Choose Florida Credit Union to help you with an auto loan today and experience the support and personal service that the big banks can't catch up to. Florida Credit Union, connecting your money to your life. Federally insured by the NCUA. Are you in need of custom screen printing, embroidery, or promotional items? Then look no further and come visit the brand new Legacy Team Sales. LTS is conveniently located off 17th Street next to Armstrong Homes in beautiful Ocala. We offer the best prices and highest quality products for your company, team, school, or nonprofit. Whether looking for screen printed shirts, embroidered polos, or travel team uniforms, you'll be sure to find it at Legacy Team Sales. Come visit our new 27,000 square foot facility. Our friendly and knowledgeable sales 
staff will assist you in every part of your custom purchase. LTS carries the hottest brands in the industry like Under Armour, Russell, Mizuno, Asics, Badger Sports, Gildan, Pacific, Ogeo, and many more. At LTS, screen printing embroidery is done in-house and we guarantee customer satisfaction. Stop by, give us a call, or check us out on the web at shoplts.com. Remember the name, LTS. 20 minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in this morning. On the phone is Johnny Smith. He is one of two authors. The other author is Randy Roberts. The two of them have written a book called Blood Brothers, Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X, The Fatal Friendship Between Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. Uh, and I, have, I, was, I had a thought during the break, Johnny, that's kind of uh, maybe an irony thought. that you, you, I, One thing I never detected about Muhammad Ali was that he was kind of in, he was in favor of the separation of the races. And you've just told us that right that's right okay um, but but, but, when, but i think he mm-hmm. actually contributed to the to the integration of the race to the to accepting of one another be, because of that friendship he had with howard cosell i mean that really in in a time when people were kind of separating us that those two guys having a friendship brought us together didn't it you bring up a great point the great sports writer george plumpton once said that you know for as much as muhammad ali talked about his belief in separatism. He never attacked the white people that were in his life. Howard Cosell, Angelo Dundee, Ferdy Pacheco, his his physician, right? Major sports writers, white writers. He had good relationships with these people. He never really acted upon the idea that he was a separatist. But he talked about it. But in private moments, you know, with sports writers or with Howard Cosell, he got along fine with them. And what he would say later, uh, later in life he would convert to a more orthodox view of Islam, a more universal and inclusive view of Islam. He said, you know, it's not the color of one's skin that makes you evil or bad. It's what you do. And so I think his (laughs) views about race and religion, they evolve over time. Yeah, well, good for him. At least he evolved. I mean, his his children seem very well leveled. We've only really met one of them, but but they, they don't seem to have any of that. They, they seem to be very well leveled. I, mean, I don't know if it's because maybe they were brought up in a different world than, than he was, but... Certainly, you know, growing up in a different time and place. You know, when we look back on the 1960s, the mid-60s, the civil rights movement is fracturing, and with good reason. The movement fractures because of this growing impatience within the movement. You know, 1963, you have the Birmingham, Birmingham bombing. 1964, you have Freedom Summer, and civil rights workers go missing and they're found uh, in an earthen dam. And the government isn't doing anything to protect them. And so many young African Americans, they're angry. They're tired of hearing about turning the other cheek and Mm -hmm. praying and waiting for the government to intervene because they're not. And so many of them embrace the views of Malcolm X. He says, we must defend our families by any means necessary. And Malcolm, excuse me, Muhammad Ali agreed with that idea. I was uh, uh, 10 in 1964, and I remember this discussion from my parents and their friends and everything about how they didn't like the fact that uh, Cassius Clay converted to Muhammad Ali, and then they brought up the Vietnam War. They thought he did mm-hmm. that because he wanted to not fight mm. for the country. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, my grandpa didn't like Muhammad Ali either. I remember talking to him at one point when I was a kid, A lot of people didn't like Muhammad Ali. He was not the beloved figure that he is today. And part of that is this rehabilitation, reconstruction of his image. We have turned him into a hero for a stance against the Vietnam War. But that was only made possible as Americans changed their views about the war. You know, 1964, 1965, still most Americans, they're in support of the war, fighting against communism, Mm -hmm. and so on. However... By 1968, after the Tet Offensive, 1969, 1970, American views about the war changed, and Muhammad Ali's view goes from being unpopular in 1966 to more popular by 1970. And so Americans' views of Ali as this symbol, not just of uh, black power, he becomes an anti-war symbol, a symbol of anti-colonialism. Were you able to speak to some of the people in, in Muhammad Ali's past to, to help with the research? Yes. You know, we, we interviewed people, important writers like Robert Lipside of the New York Times, who, who 
really followed Clay in 1964, covered his major fights, the championship fight against Sonny Liston, Jerry Eisenberg, another prominent writer who knew Ali well. But the fact is, is that the people who were closest to him at that moment in time, most of them are dead. All of Ali's opponents mm. from that time in his career, they're gone. And so it's crucial for us to go back to what historians call primary sources. Those are the kinds of sources that existed at that moment in time. And so that meant looking at day-to-day -day coverage in newspapers, magazines, Sports Illustrated. We also looked at FBI files. The FBI was following Malcolm X. Oh, they had uh, oh, informants yeah. in the Nation of Islam. Uh, the State Department covered Ali's trip to, the, to Africa and the Middle East in 1964, so we looked at government documents. And so being a historian is kind of like a detective. You take all of these pieces, yeah. it's like a jigsaw puzzle, and you piece it together. Yeah. Do you think that the uh, um, uh, Black Lives Matter movement is doing more harm than good? There are uh, a lot of uh, sports athletes that uh, come out and uh, talk about this, and do you think it's an, inten an intentional separation of the races instead of saying all lives matter? I don't. I don't think that... that the statement that Black Lives Matter is an intentional separation of the races. I think the facts bear out that there is a disproportionate uh, assault uh, on black lives in America. And to say that Black Lives Matter is not to say that white lives do not matter. But I think it's an acknowledgement of the history in America where blacks have been dis disproportionately assaulted. And so I think this is a message that echoes back to what Malcolm X was saying. Malcolm X never came out and said, okay, black people, get your rifles and just open up on whites. He didn't say that. What he said was this. If you don't have protection in your community, you have a right to defend yourself. You have a right to defend your family. And so that's an important message, I think, that, that, that Malcolm made that is still relevant to this very day. We have a phone call coming in. Uh, once again, our guest is uh, Johnny Smith. The book is called Blood Brothers, The Fatal Friendship Between Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. And, uh, and let's go to the phone. Good morning. You're on the air. Thank you for calling and for waiting. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, sir, uh, how many wives did uh, Muhammad Ali have? And uh, he, from the one marriage, his daughter was a professional fighter. Is she still involved in fighting? How many wives? Layla, Layla Ali, yes. Um, you know, I don't know if she's still actually active in fighting. I know she was at a time when she was younger, but I know she's also been a spokesperson for Subway Sandwiches, mm -hmm. and um, she's also invo involved in community action and trying to help children with various educational programs, which I think is a reflection of how his father moved later in his life. You know, Muhammad Ali loved kids, and he connected with young people, and I think... You know, part of his legacy that is very positive is the way that he connected with people, and I think his daughter um, does the same thing very well. Um, yes, Muhammad Ali did have uh, a number of marriages. We really only talk about his first marriage in this book because the other marriages came after the scope of our project. Uh, he married a woman named uh, Sanji Roy, and the relationship between Sanji and Muhammad Ali was tenuous. Uh, members in the Nation of Islam did not really approve of Ali's marriage with Sanji because she did not embrace uh, the religious tenets of the Nation of Islam, and ultimately they were divorced. Did, did, did his success contribute not just to, to, to boxing but to all athletics in, in, in America? Did we, do we see African Americans uh, becoming more... more uh, more acceptable, I guess. I don't even know how to ask the question without sounding sure. racist, but in, in different sports, like in football and baseball, like some sports you don't see as many, mm -hmm. and I don't know why. Like in, in uh, golf, for example, you have Tiger Woods and a few others, and that's yeah. it. Well, I think the answer to that lies in economics, right? You know, in, in communities where you have a higher population of uh, African-American people who might not have access to p uh, private golf courses, it's very hard to, to play into those sports, right? You need a, a specialized coach. Whereas in basketball and football, there's more accessibility to those sports, right? To play basketball, oh, yeah. all you need is a hoop, right, and a ball. It's, it's not as expensive. So that's part of the phenomenon. But if we go back to the 1960s, I think sports were very important in shaping the racial consciousness. In the 60s, more than ever before, you have 
black players in the NBA like Will Chamberlain and Bill Russell and Oscar Robertson. You have black baseball players like Henry Aaron and Willie Mays. And I think what happens is for white folks who maybe did not embrace black people in their own lives, they watch the games and they stand up and they cheer for a yeah, black man yeah, for the yeah, first time. Yeah. And it makes well, them and, come to terms with their views. Yeah, I've often thought music as well, music and sports, both contributed to us finally growing up in this country. Um, what a fascinating conversation. The book is called Blood Brothers. Call me if you want the copy that was sent to us. We've got t- 10 seconds. My goodness, I'm so sorry. Um, do you have a website we can go to, Johnny? Well, I, I don't have a particular website, but you can follow me on Twitter at Sports His Prof. Okay, well, thank you so much. We'll be right back. Fox News Radio, I'm Lillian Wu. A state of emergency in effect in Virginia after tornadoes rip across parts of the East Coast. Fox TV affiliate WTTG's Annie Yu is in Waverly, Virginia. Virginia governor declared that state of emergency to speed up the disaster aid here, and it's going to be quite some time before they can get this cleaned up. Four people killed in the state, including a two-year-old. In South Carolina, a man died after a tree fell on him. Three pregnant women testing positive for the Zika virus in Florida. Health officials say the case appear to be travel related. 